welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Brian Broom. Last week we talked about revivalism of a certain brand. Today we're going to talk about how that's not really normal. Uh, normally, the pattern of God's work in history is little by little, and that's exactly what he said to the Israelites as they were going to conquer Canaan. It's little by little, I will drive out the people before you uh, for the sake of the land. He didn't want the land to be desolate. So when we when we look at history, often we get this idea that it's big thing after big thing after big thing, because let's face it, there's a lot to cover and you can't cover everything. Uh, we're, we're telling a story and so we have to hit the high points, the things that had a big impact that we can see and make some beginning of understanding. And that seemed to make a huge difference then, or at least from our perspective now. Mm -hmm. But that's not all that history is in the sense of things that happen. Everything that happens is history, right? But it's not the telling of history. And so as we look back over our lives, we are often tempted to say, my life doesn't matter. I would never go down in a history book. Other people, if my name will just go down in history, then it will all be worth it. Really? (laughs) And and as as we bring this to the Christian life, the reality is that most of our life is, what, more dishes to wash again? (laughs) Diapers again? The lawns needs to be mowed. I did it last week. Car needs to wash. I did it six months ago. Can it just stay clean? <laughs> um, so I have to get up and go to work again. I just did that yesterday. So much of life, the Christian life, is simple, repetitive, and endlessly so. You can think here of the book of Ecclesiastes. I spoke in staff mm-hmm. devotions this morning about that part of, of uh, the wise man's message. Things The winds go round and round and round. Um, The oceans get evaporated and become waters. They go back to the oceans, and that goes round and round and round. People are born and people die. The cycle seems endless. Where's the meaning in all of this? And Christians, we we want there to be more, and we trust there is more. We know that one day we'll go home to be Jesus. That's more. One day Jesus will come back. That's really more. But when God steps into our mundane existence, our ordinary pattern of life, and does something really, really cool from our point of view, really extravagant, really huge, like a great awakening or a reformation, we get all excited about that, and understandably so. Those are great times to live in. At least they seem like they would be from our point of view. <laughs> Maybe, Maybe if not. you ask Martin Luther, yeah, you have a might, different opinion. Have There's a, a lot opinion. of plague, a lot of, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, I don't know. George Whitfield didn't live very long. Um, but it, it, it just can seem that when you balance out the ordinary Christian life of doing dishes, doing diapers, going to church, reading your Bible, having children, going to work, and then going to work, and then going to work, and then going to work. It, 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 go to church, go to church, go to church. <laughs> hear a sermon, hear a sermon, hear a sermon. It, it can seem that that isn't as spiritual, certainly isn't as exciting, as when God just pours out his spirit suddenly and people are tripping over themselves to come to Christ. Hundreds and thousands profess faith. Some of the worst people in town are bemoaning their sins and calling on the name of Jesus. And, and it just goes on and on sometimes. Even even civil governments are transformed. New missionary societies are created. Missionaries are funded and sent to the ends of the earth. And and churches' attendance skyrocket. And we say, that's, that's what we want. That's what we've been waiting for. I've used the words analog and digital. Maybe they make sense here. Mm-hmm. Things that are analog... Uh, just kind of follow a slow, wavy pattern. If I was at 3.5 yesterday, I'll probably rise up to 3.6 today or maybe drop to 3.2, but I'm not going to be at 12. That's digital. From 3 to 12 to 100, those kind of spikes where we go from something 
small to something huge just like that, it's, at least that's what I'm labeling as digital. It's it's yeah. It's, and I the think changes that, that seem to come out of nowhere. That seems very apt because what is the digital but an approximation of the analog? Well, the mm -hmm. reality that's going on underneath is far more. There are far more layers of precision mm -hmm. than we measure with our digital clock or our digital multimeter, right. or whatever we're doing. It's an approximation of what's really going on. And we we can use this analogy to, to look at life and say, all right, so is the Christian life analog or is it digital? Or or more to the point, perhaps, the coming of the kingdom. Is it analog or digital? Is it do we does the kingdom advance by huge revival after huge revival, separated sometimes by decades or centuries, if not millennium? Linea. Or is it a slow grinding process that doesn't ever really se seem to admit of any great change? That's basically pe people living out their dull, repetitive lives in the fear of God. Families that get up in the morning and have breakfast and maybe read the Bible and say a prayer and go off and do their work and come home and have dinner and maybe have family devotions pray together for their, their church and their family and maybe their nation, and then go to bed and do it all over again the next day. And at the end of the week, they go to church and they worship God and they tithe. And they are sanctified a little bit at a time here and there over the course of a lifetime. Uh, that seems to be the normal, that, that seems to be what most of us would call normal. It's just what most of us would not call exciting. And beginning with the... Um, with the great revivals in early America, the, the Great Awakening, Second Awakening, we see what becomes almost uh, the assumption of or an addiction to the next big thing, the next great revival. I had sure. a teacher who called them the pretty good awakenings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's, there's, there's much to be said for that, actually. Because we tend to see it through rose-colored glasses. We hear all of the reports of the people who were there or close to being there and tell us all the wonderful changes that were wrought. And it's only when you're 20 or 30 or 40 years older and you actually begin to read the history books and find out the rest of the story, you find out there were some problems, most of them doctrinal, some of them practical. Uh, there was this phenomenon I think you both know about called um, uh, camp meeting babies. People would come to the, the revival meetings at the, the camp meetings in the frontier. And everybody would come from all over the place, hundreds and thousands of people. And they get really excited about Jesus. And some of the young people get really excited about Jesus. And being really excited, they go into the bushes and get really excited. And nine months later, babies would show up. And it was um, a pretty common thing. Mm -hmm. Within the last couple of years, I found out that it was also a kind of regular thing during the, the original Great Awakening, too. Because when religious impulse or religious excitement isn't bound by the word of God and by the structures that God has appointed, religious fervor and emotion can do what emotion and fervor do all the time. It can just run amok. And it all seems wonderful. There's a there's a section you may remember in Huck Finn where uh, Huck and the, the was it the Duke and the what was the other guy's to answer that question, I would have to have read Huck Finn. Oh. <laughs> um, and yes, I am teaching that this fall. So <laughs> the, the two con men, one of them who claims to be a duke and the other, I forget what he claims to be. They stop by uh, a little riverside town and there's a revival meeting going on. And Huck watched And Twain obviously had been at these because he describes them very accurately. There's the pre there's a long-winded preaching, the excitement, and there's a lot of young ladies who are getting remotely sentimental and and, and there are some boys kind of hanging back and they see, wow, these girls are just giving hugs to everybody who comes to Jesus. <laughs> and so they decide to go come to Jesus so they can go over to the girls and start getting hugs. It goes from there. Um, but Mark Twain turns it into something rather humorous rather than to the horrible thing it could be. But even Twain was familiar with this kind of phenomena uh, late in the 1840s or 50s, whenever Huck Finn was written. There is a day, there are a number of dangers in waiting for the next great thing. Because for one thing, it begins to shift our faith, our attention, our commitment away from Jesus, away from the preaching of the gospel and the normal means of grace to something big. And we're not content until the big thing comes. 
yeah, I sit here day after day reading the Bible with my children, but what good's that doing? Oh, that God would send revival. Uh, and, and we have in mind those kind of revivals where the, the Holy Spirit sweeps in and does incredible things. And he has on occasion, no doubt about it. Uh, they're mixed works because that's God's will. He doesn't prefer, uh, perform instantaneous sanctification in anybody in this life. But lots and lots of people come to Christ. So lots and lots of people draw nearer to him. Gospel goes out to people who've never heard wonderful things. And, and having been through that, the temptation, first, first is the temptation is, oh, will it ever come? When it comes, yes, this is what it's all about. This is the kind of Christianity I signed on for. And then there's it the ends. And then it ends. <laughs> you and go home from summer camp. <laughs> you go home from summer camp. And I've had lots of students over the years who've had exactly these experiences. Summer camp was so great. They come back and they're talking about it. And they're so excited for a day or two or three. And little by little, it grinds down. And on the one hand, you try, or they try, to stir up those same feelings again by artificial means. Or they start to get a little depressed and wonder if it really happened, if it was really real. Some of them come back down and understand, okay, it was a mountaintop experience. I'm now off the mountain. That's the way it's going to be. But this thing of trying to stir it up on your own, and that's what has marked the history of American evangelism, uh, American um, revivalism. When these awakenings came, they produced great emotion. Therefore, so a great emotion and the Holy Spirit go together. So if God isn't really doing anything, maybe we can prime the pump by introducing the great emotion, getting people excited about God, and then the Holy Spirit will just kind of kick in at some point and, and we'll have this wonderful revival meeting. Uh, and I assume that you, like I have, have driven past churches with banners outside declaring, Revival coming next week. <laughs> um, they got the Holy Spirit the to sign of, on to a schedule. <laughs> eventually, right? the the meaning of the word shifts, and yeah. it's like, oh, well, we're having a revival. It's like, oh, how are you mm -hmm. scheduling that? Well, it's it's easy. We put up the tent. Like we had a <laughs> revival. It's it's just that. It's the meeting. Yeah, it, it it has to be in a tent. Couldn't just have it during a normal church service. With uh, our regular, it, it has, some guy has to come in from outside usually. It's reg rarely just our regular pastor because he's pretty ordinary. Ordinary like the means of grace? Like the means we'll of get grace. To that. Yeah. <laughs> so in, in American history, to, to step back that direction for a second, after Finney and after the Second Awakening, we see an ongoing tradition in American evangelicalism of trying to prime the pump, of announcing revivals, of, of praying better, praying for revivals, and not really being content until they come, and, and expecting them to look like the last one. Mm -hmm. And that, that's something I don't address in the article, but I think it's something that we could talk about. Uh, for From where I stand, the Christian school movement, the homeschool movement, the pro-life movement, were part of one huge revival. Now, they didn't look like any of the revivals we'd seen before. But what did you get? You got people dedicating themselves to teaching their children the Bible, in fact, seeing all of life through the Bible, and then risking a lot to go and stand for that in public. Uh, now, the flaw here was it didn't always reach back into the churches. We, we did not see a great deal of doctrinal revival. Of course, we didn't in the Second Awakening either. Mm -hmm. uh, it had it, actually we saw the opposite. We saw more and more of a common ground, lowest common denominator approach to theology because this is this is Catholic in the worst possible sense. <laughs> Let's. It's not well. We all believe X number of things that are true. We can put them in a confession. And we can all preach this. It's like okay, it's all about Jesus and loving the sinner and, and bringing him down the aisle. Right? Okay, go. You stand over there, you stand over there, you stand over there. And, you know, you preach from the stump, you preach from the log, and I'll, I'll, I'll preach from the top of the wagon. And we'll count up how many people came to Christ at the end. Yeah, there's a reason we refer to big tent evangelicalism or big tent conservatism. It's mm -hmm. 
this was the original big tent. <laughs> no, let's just. Well, yeah, and then of course the the other danger is that eventually the your your orthopraxy starts to affect your view of what church is supposed to do and what, what mm-hmm. it's supposed to be. So now you have people going around saying, well, you know, your church isn't doing enough to spread the gospel. It's like, what do you mean? Mm-hmm. We've been preaching the gospel for 85 years Yeah, every Sunday here. And, and we're all part of the community. We all help each other out and we do X and Y and we, you know, give to foreign missions or some of us have gone out and done foreign missions. Well, yeah, but you're not doing a big tent revival every every two weeks, every three weeks. And well, that's just how you got to do it. That's the gospel. Yeah. You're not spreading the gospel. Yeah. And so you not, used a word that we haven't. Calls. <laughs> yeah, altar calls. Let's yes. see our last episode. Uh, you used a word that we haven't yet used on oh. the podcast. Brian, Would you, you should define mind? the term. Yes. What is orthopraxy? Was it? Orthopraxy. Orthopraxy. Uh, two Greek words, ortho and prax. Sis. <laughs> yes, praxis. <laughs> that is the word. <laughs> um, ortho meaning correct and praxis meaning uh, action. So, in other words, you, you're you're living a right way. You are acting in a in a right way. Often in the reform world, we use a phrase like um, you know, orthodox, or, orthodoxy implies orthopraxy. Or at least we express the the concept of that phrase. I saw a um, um, banner, whatever, meme, in the back of the church building we the school used to use. It said, your theology ought to be your reality. I mm-hmm. thought that was pretty good. Um, That's good. Not only in the sense of how you discern things, but, you know, if you believe that that's a wall. You're not going to try to walk through <laughs> <Right>. it <laughs> without first fighting the door that goes through the wall. Mm. Uh, if this is a the ledge of a five story building, you're not going to walk over it because your sense of reality will keep you from doing anything so stupid. Reality is not simply a state of mind. It's it ultimately is how you conform to that state of mind, your perception of what's there and what isn't there and what's possible and what's not possible and what's likely to happen if I do if if I do X, will Y in fact happen? Theology describes the knowledge of God, describes for us what the world's like and how it works. And we need to not just have that be something we believe bookishly, but something that actually shapes the choices we make and how we live and what we do. Back to let me let me finish off with um, the whole revival thing because I did. This is what's happened in the church, but we have to understand that something similar was happening in the broader culture at the same time. Mm-hmm. We we talked about this last week. So while the church gave us revivalism, the the world gave us with uh, cooperation with the church sometimes reform movement after reform movement, temperance uh, meetings. Temperance meetings. It wasn't just societies. The societies yeah. got together. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and with a lot of these things, it was getting people together, getting them excited, pushing the emotion. It wasn't just writing tracts and pamphlets. It wasn't just conducting logical arguments or attempting to push through legislation, though all of those things happened. But there was a lot of emotional excitement of a religious nature. And, and this goes down to, you can think here of the Civil War and abolition. I mean, what more emotionally moving song is there than the Battle Hymn of the Republic? I mean, you just hear the Jolene. strands. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Jolene, maybe. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm, I'm even going to throw a flag on that one. <laughs> <laughs> My daughter should agree, however. Um, you know, glory, glory, hallelujah. I mean, it's, it's we've sung it so long. It sounds so grand and proud and driven and marching and all that and... How often do we stop and actually look at the words and realize what this came out of and what it alludes back to? John Brown's body lies of moldering in the grave. His truth is marching on. These things became matters of religious fervor. Oh, I was right. I was um, doing some notes for my econ class. and, And I found that this thing extended up into the civil right movement of the late 1800s. When uh, and, and we should have figured this out when William Jennings <laughs> Bryan said, "You shall not press down this crown of thorns upon the brow of labor. You shall not crucify mankind upon a crown of gold." He did I not do cross that. Of gold. Cross of gold. He did not say that simply to reach for an obscure religious image. 
the whole meeting was conducted like a revival meeting. And people saw themselves as moved by the Spirit of God in the cause of God's kingdom. It was still that. The country had not yet apostatized so far, but that they thought in terms of the Christianity they knew, but the Christianity they knew was revivalistic. One more big push, and we can change the world. We can change the government. We'll use the power of the government to bring about goodness and light and life. And the millennium will be ushered in or utopia, whatever you want to call it. And everything will be better. Maybe it's, maybe it is one last war to end all wars. And as late as World War I, that's still that same kind of thought process and language. A war to make the world safe for democracy. We can save the world. Yes, it's messy. It's going to cost lives. We're sorry. We really don't want to do it, but. One last push to save Christian civilization. They still use that kind of language. It's late as World War I. Uh, late as today. Yeah, as late as today. We still are, are suckers for it. No American president has ever become president without using that kind of language. Now, no appeal to Jesus or the gospel or more than a passing mention of the Bible or some verse yanked out of context. But those kind of images that go with revivalism, the language of, of liberty and freedom and peace and love for all mankind and universalism that the gospel has have been have been very common. And if you got up and tried to run for office and said, my goal is simply to change nothing, do nothing, maybe step back a few uh, steps on every front and let people be, you will get zero votes. <laughs> You might get a couple libertarians. <laughs> <laughs> They're idealistic I enough think, to vote I for think them. all of them... You'd actually get a, a fair chunk of them, at least the non-libertarian party ones. <laughs> They'd be like, finally, someone <laughs> just gets wants it. to leave us alone. <laughs> oh, yeah. well, I mean, I mean I, and you even see um, that kind of attitude reflected in certain sectors of reformdom, if you will, <laughs> where it's it's not okay, you know. It's not this little by little expanding of the kingdom. It's a, well, maybe if we can get the right person into office in our mm -hmm. district and we can get right. this person uh, to enact this law that's based on a biblical principle. And, you know, uh, maybe every, maybe soon, maybe next year, <laughs> next year in um, Washington, D.C., um, <laughs> The, the the bombs drop and society has to be rebuilt from the ground up and we can <laughs> finally build the foolproof Christian government and God will, you know, enact the, the golden age and everyone gets a puppy and a water buffalo and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Wait, I, I already have mine. Don't you have one? Um, well, yours, yours, is fast, yours is pretty fast. Mine is slow. <laughs> hey, hey, there it is. <laughs> Oh, well, let's bring this back to the concrete example that Scripture gives us, which uh, mm -hmm. brings us to Judges, which is kind of where we are. We just left Joshua with his his farewell speech. We're coming to Judges. It was Exodus where Jesus, or Jesus, yes, true, Jehovah said, uh, little by little, uh, I will, I'll drive, you'll, you'll drive them out little by little so the beasts don't multiply against you. Land doesn't become desolate. So we come to we come to Judges, and Judges begins by recounting the early victories. But the early victories are kind of so-so. Uh, they're not altogether horrible. Um, uh, Judah goes first and does pretty well. Simeon goes with them. That seems to be working well. We have the story of Caleb and Aksa and uh, Othniel repeated, and that, that, that's good. Uh, and then things begin to change just a little. I'm going, to, I'm going to read and skim here a little bit. This is from Judges chapter 1, uh, verse 22. The house of Joseph, they also went up against Bethel, and the Lord was with them. And the house of Joseph sent to decry Bethel. Spies found a man. The man agrees to show them what's going on. And that works, but the man escapes. He goes into another country and builds another city after the same name. There's a little leak. It's not a big thing, but the Bible thinks it's worth mentioning. Neither did Manasseh drive out the inhabitants of Bethshan and her towns, nor Tanakh and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Dor and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Laam and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Megiddo and her towns, but the Canaanites would dwell in the land. They would dwell in the land. 
No, we're staying. We're not moving. We have swords. Don't care. You're not moving us. We're right here. It came to pass you when Israel make me. You can't make me. It was it came to pass when Israel was strong that they put the Canaanites to tribute and did not utterly drive them out. Oops. That wasn't anywhere in the playbook. God did not say kill them, but if that is a work, you know, tribute tribute tribute's the second um, best alternative. Uh, neither did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites that dwelt in Gezer, but the Canaanites dwelt in Gezer among them. No mention of tribute there. Neither did Zebulun drive out the inhabitants of Ketron or the inhabitants of Nehalal, but the Canaanites dwelt among them, became tributaries. Neither did Asher drive out the inhabitants of Akko, nor the inhabitants of Zidon, nor of Alab, nor of Oxib, nor of Helba, nor of Aphek, nor of Rehob, but the Asherites dwelt among the Canaanites. The inhabitants of the land, for they did not drive them out. So, so far, the Canaanites had been there dwelling in the midst of Israel, in their little towns. Now Israel's dwelling in the midst of the Canaanites. They, they, don't, they don't have the consensus anymore. They've lost it. They're there, but there's no talk of making them tribute. So they're, they're, now they're the ones being tolerated. Neither did Naphtali drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh, nor the inhabitants of uh, Beth Anath, but these dwelt among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land. Nevertheless, the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh and Beth, uh, Beth Anath became tributary to, to them. Okay, so we're, we're kind of stepping back again. And the Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountain, for they would not suffer them to come down into the valley. But the Amorites would dwell in Mount Harry's and Ashalon and in uh, Shalibim. And yet the hand of Joseph prevailed so that they became tributaries and so on. So the Danites, they can't, they don't even manage to kick them out or, or even reach they taught. The Canaanites drive them up into the forest and won't let them come down into the mountain, which is one reason that they go for that little, hey, let's go up north and see if there's anything up there. Um, in chapter two, God passes a verdict on this. He comes to them and he says this, I made you to go up out of Egypt and have brought you into the land which I swear unto your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and you shall make no league with the inhabitants of the land, but you shall throw down their altars. But you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Wherefore, I also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be snares unto you. Israel weeps over that one. So God's has now added a different reason for why they're not going to do this overnight, because they didn't. Uh, God had told them it would be a little by little, but their little by little was slower than God's little by little. <laughs> they, they started compromising. They didn't push the claims of their God. They didn't fight the wars of the Lord. They pushed so far, and then they got lazy. They got tired. They decided to back down. They figured they taught was an acceptable solution. Until the bad guys started pushing back on them, and then they started complaining that they didn't have enough territory. Tribe of Dan here. And God finally steps in, blows the whistle, and says, wait, this was not the arrangement. So you don't want to drive them out. Then I'm not going to drive them out. They're going to be thorns in your side, thorns in your eyes. Now, Paul will later use this language to speak of the mm -hmm. thorn of the flesh that he had. Mm -hmm. God leaves us with temptations and trials and difficult things so that we learn to rely on him. And here God now officially is leaving the next generation enemies to fight because it's tough enough to live the godly life when you have no enemies. When everything's fine and there's an overabundance of material blessing and you have stuff that you didn't fight for and didn't work for and didn't save for, and it's just all delivered into your hand, it can be really hard to be a Christian under those circumstances. When everyone's a Christian, in my own Christian college, there was a lot of joke about, jokes, I don't know if that's even the word, sarcasm about, there are too many covenant kids here. Mm -hmm. These are these are college students. And um, if anyone went up on the roof of the, of the guy's hall at the end of the weekend, they would find that there was an awful lot of beer bottles and beer cans on the roof because people on the third floor would just, when they finished, they would just kind of reach out and throw up and back. Mm -hmm. A lot of drunkenness going on in this Christian college. And I remember that uh, our, our RA, when he was running through the rules 
uh, for fresh incoming freshmen, although I was a junior at the time. He said, well, okay, here's this thing about posters of women. Well, what that means for now, guys, is that all you women have to have their clothes on. That was as much of a stand as the school was going to take on this. Tolerating drunkenness and lust. I mean, are these things issues for Christian kids? Yeah, they really are. And therefore, they need to be addressed and dealt with very seriously, with much love and tenderness and prayer, but they need to be dealt with and just kind of say, well, you know, it's a problem. We're not going to face it. It's exactly what these kind of, these people were doing in, in uh, the days of the judges. You you haven't taken it seriously. So we're, being covenant kids didn't work so well. Having your own little enclave where everybody in town goes to church, they did in my little community. Every morning, you could see them trooping off to their respective Reformed churches in town. There's like one atheist in town. Everyone knew who he was. <laughs> one Baptist church. Everything else was, was Reformed churches. And yet there was a coldness in the next generation. And so God's solution is, you need to fight the battles of the Lord. You need to see what it costs to be a Christian, where things are tough and hard and people get in your face. And eventually, where there may even be real persecution and when even possibly someone, some of you may have to die for your loyalty to Jesus. And, and, and so God says that he's going to leave these nations to prove Israel, to test her so that they can fight the battles of the Lord. And so what happens, though, for the next 300 years is that Israel, this is the book of Judges, and it's, it's depressing to read. And anyone who reads it intelligently eventually comes back and says, what was that all about? I mean, because here's what happens. A generation will stand up and serve God. At the end of that generation, the next generation apostatizes, goes after the false gods of sex and power, Baal and Ashtaroth. They adopt a foreign lifestyle, a pagan culture. God says, you want to live in a pagan world? Fine, I'll send you pagans to rule you. And he sends in a nation that will conquer them, subdue them, and will um, terror, terrorize them, oppress them politically, economically, for X number of years. And each X gets bigger and bigger as we go through the book. Uh, it gets longer and longer until finally, in most cases, Israel repents and calls to God. There's once or twice where God just says, okay, you're not doing anything enough of this. Let's try a different approach. But normally God pushes them to repentance. And so when they repent, then God raises up a judge who uses often very odd strategies and tactics, uh, things that don't make sense from a human point of view to show that this, this is the battle of the Lord. This is God at work here. He'll drive out the enemies, and then he will judge Israel, and they will serve the Lord for that generation. And then the next generation will fall away. And one of the questions, and this is something we'll come to eventually, is why? What, what was their big hang-up about passing on to the faith to the next generation? Why couldn't the next generation ever seem to take hold of the covenant and get serious about walking with God, about fighting the battles of the Lord? God never gave them flowery beds of ease. He kept throwing at them the Moabites and the Philistines and the Ammonites and the Amorites and Canaanites and you know, everybody after them. And yet they couldn't spiritually get their act together. They kept choosing not to. And that's judges. And it's, um, people ask, what's, is this what the gospel does? It just loses generation after generation? Um, one of our uh, elders many years ago now was teaching through this. and People said, how do you square this with post-millennialism? <laughs> and he apparently didn't have an immediate answer because he asked me what about that. And I said, oh, really easy. The judges weren't Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, they, they didn't have the spiritual power. He, and even in, as judges, they failed a lot. Yeah. Gideon, Samson. Yeah. Just as the, the kings after, like a big message of the book of Kings is these kings failed. You need a better king. Yeah. And in the same way, we need a better judge. We need a better judge. We need a better war leader who fights on different terms. And that's, and that's where judges pretty much leaves. In fact, the last, we'll, we'll look at the, the two sections later on, probably several uh, broadcasts from now. But at the end of Judges, there are two stories, both concerning Levites. We see that one Levite sells his spiritual birthright for a mess of pottage. Basically, come be my come be my priest and worship, help me worship my idols and I'll give you money, food, and clothes. Okay. Another Levite um, 
when challenged to defend his wife, runs away, hides. Um, and yet these are supposed to be shepherds who image Jesus, the divine bridegroom, who always gives himself for his bride. So they, these are men who would sell out the faith for money, who lack commitment, not only to Christ, but to their own wives. And then when we get it in the next book of Samuel, we see that it was not only the Levites, it was the priests. We run into Hophni and Phinehas, who are actually raping the nuns at the tabernacle door, and as well as stealing from the sacrifices. And God, at the end of this, has just about had enough and uh, deserts the tabernacle. The glory departs, the ark goes into captivity. So uh, they, these were generations, to bring this back to theme, each generation had its next big thing. And none of them lasted because the next big thing did not carry on to the next generation. That requires the hard duty of nurturing your children in the faith, living a godly life day by day, being faithful to your wife, each day, each week, each month, going to church Sunday after Sunday, uh, making use of the, the normal standard means of grace. If God wants to do something spectacular, great for God, and we'll be there. We'll jump on board. But in the meantime, line upon line, precept upon precept. Uh, and um, in the meantime, we keep praying, thy kingdom come. And we've been doing that for 2,000 years, and it's not all here yet. We have victory in principle. I mean, Jesus is coming. He's on the throne of the universe where uh, children of God reigning in heavenly places with Christ Jesus and all of that. But aren't there more souls to save? Isn't the word of God to have greater effect? Aren't there more nations that need to be discipled? Or is God <laughs> Don't settled? we still have indwelling sin? Don't we still have mm. indwelling sin that needs to be challenged? One writer said, you know, with all that Jesus has done, there's literally nothing else that has to happen before Jesus comes back. This is a reformed guy. Um, so in other words, no one else out there needs to be saved. The church doesn't need to grow. I don't need to grow. Literally, nothing else needs to happen. Something's just the way it's said doesn't doesn't ring true. I, I have an inkling of what he may have meant by it that is not as egregious, but as well, said, I, I, it's slightly yeah. odd. Yeah, and, and I think I know what he meant too, and I think it was just a really bad way of saying it. What he's saying, I think what he's saying is the Bible has not prophesied anything else of significance. God may or may not send something that we consider significant, but all the prophecies have been fulfilled, and so there is on that level no God would not break, be breaking his word if Jesus came back tomorrow. That and was I my inkling. At, yeah. Yeah. And I look <laughs> at the Great Commission and say, really? Really? Uh, Jesus, he was joking when he told us to do that. He, he the, the command does not imply any sort of promise. And even him saying he would be with us to the end of the world, don't put too much on that. I, I can't buy that. I don't, the whole New Testament is alive with victory. Not simply the victory that Jesus has already accomplished, but the outworking of that victory in earth and history and in the real lives of his people. For for any Christian, just, and, and in our, my own little tiny denomination has struggled with this particular heresy. I'm hoping you to have never been heard of it. But it's basically a denial of progressive sanctification. I've come to Christ. I'm in Christ. Christ perfect. And therefore... There's, I don't, that's sanctification. I, I'm positionally sanctified in him. And that's all that God ever required. I, I mean, I can't really grow or change or do anything. Our denomination struggled with that for decades. And My. I think some of the old guard may still cling to it secretly. That's that's kind of interesting because I, I just finished listening to an episode about a cult in the 19th century that was a Christian perfectionism cult where the, the leader basically said, I am without sin and so are all of you and anything we do is fine. So just do whatever weird stuff you want. Yeah, this this one that was actually fairly common. This is this was different in that it's kind of the inverse. Yeah. He recog oh. the, the guy who started the, the, the theologian's name was Kohlbrucky, I think. Nice German name. Uh, but he was basically not saying we don't sin, but that it doesn't matter. Because there's nothing you can do about it. Jesus uh, has already paid for it. 
and you already are united to him and God sees you in him. So how is maybe, that different than just regular garden variety antinomianism? It's not really. <laughs> it's, <Okay. laughs> it's, it's, it's just trying to just to fight. Well, there's that word. It's trying to justify it through justification. You know, mm. I've been justified by faith. So I don't need to do anything else. And, and more to the point, I really can't do anything else. My, it was about my first, second year of teaching. I went to a missions conference, uh, Bakersfield area. And there was one pastor who still kind of held on to this. And he was debating with my pastor, the man who would one day be my pastor about this. And he kept, and I asked him, are you, so what would you say if someone comes to you and, and, and confesses a deep sin? Well, I would tell him that he needs to look at who he is in Christ and, and um, what Christ has done for him. Which, which in itself is not a bad answer. Yeah. It's only the beginning of an answer. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, isn't it possible that somebody could have substantial victory over sin and and become a better Christian, more faithful in particular areas than others? And he, he thought about it, kind of said, it, if I remember his voice pattern, he said, well, it's possible, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, huh. No, it's more than just possible. It's kind of what sanctification demands, progressive sanctification. He was obviously not Presbyterian. So sad that you know you can't even look back at your own life and say, "Wow, the Lord grew me in that yeah, particular not, experience or in this way." Yeah. yeah, it's not that we're claiming entire sanctification. Like after fifty years, I'm free from sin. It's after fifty years, I know my sins. In fact, I had yeah. this conversation with the guy too. Yeah, <laughs> you think if after fifty years you're going to know your sins so much better? Yes, this is so. However. That doesn't mean you haven't beat some of them along the way and that some areas you have overcome. Yes, you now know that they're worse than you thought they were, but that's not the same thing. I mean, even that's a sanctification. Your understanding, mm -hmm. your conscience has become yeah. sharper than it was. That's a good thing, although it hurts. You, you can still look back and say, in so many ways, I'm not who I was back then. Yeah. Um, and what yeah. is true for the individual is true for the church as a whole. We don't have to believe that the church is somehow going to be perfect to believe that there is a room for substantial growth, substantial collective sanctification, till we all come in the unity of faith and knowledge of the Son of God into a perfect man, till we make up a body worthy of our head, as Paul describes in Ephesians 4. We also don't have to think of the church as being so denigrated and so horrible that there's only room for improvement. We can recognize that the church has, has yeah. made strides and that even, even if it's uh, at some point in the future, more perfect than it is now that there will still be room. Yeah. There's it's always like, going to be room for growth. But if you can't look at say the apostles creed, then compare it to the Nicene creed, then the form of Chalcedon, then skip a few generations to look at the three forms of unity or the Westminster confession of faith and say, has there been growth here? Do we understand God better than we did? Well, at least some of us seem to. <laughs> Maybe you haven't read the confessions lately. Maybe there's more to study now than we ever thought there was. It's one thing that annoys me just when I think, okay, I think I've got these areas of theology under control. At least I haven't missed anything too major, I think. And some of them write a book like, oh, no, I thought that you know, I, I read the book you recommended. I'm reading the book you read on simplicity. Oh, yeah. And I thought... You know, I, I, I pretty well understand what's going on here. Brian says, this is a great book, so I'm going to read this. And wow, it's a hard book. Well, it's a dense <laughs> book. And wow, there's stuff going on there that I missed. And I, I, it was nice to find out that, okay, I'm yes, got that. Yes, I've been saying that. Yeah, that's good. I, I'm not quite sure what that means. And, I, and, and honestly, his appeal to Aquinas and to Aristotelian categories was kind of eh, at times. <laughs> but still, fundamentally, but then I found out, oh, and here are all these people who are opposing this doctrine of the unity of God and the simplicity of God because they don't get it and it's hard. And they want God to be different. Yeah. No, no, you can't. So as the more we understand scripture even the more we understand where we have failed to understand scripture and we the more we understand how many people around us don't get it but that doesn't mean we give up or we or we say okay we're done or there's nothing there's no more work to do there's always more work to do mm -hmm. there's always room to grow now in the cutting to the chase in the original article i i suggested three things. I think we've probably talked about these, but I see one I want to make sure that we, we get to. 
what shall we say to these things? Well, first of all, God works through human weakness so that the glory of his victory may be more self-evidently his own. Mm -hmm. um, if God poured out his spirit like he did in the Reformation or Pentecost every other week, we'd get lazy and cranky and full of ourselves and wouldn't take God seriously and wouldn't have to wrestle with him or with our own sins. And it would just, we, we would forget how good God is because we forget how wicked we are. Uh, we, we wouldn't see his profound wisdom. We just take it as a matter of course. I mean, you know, you watch, you watch a, okay, uh, the last Avenger movie where Captain Marvel suddenly steps in. <laughs> Mega power to blast things away. And everyone says, so why didn't she just use it? She set her up. She had superpower beyond measure. So <laughs> where was the big struggle here? Uh, and the DC's been struggling with that with Superman for decades. You give somebody this much power, where's the interest? Well, of course, he's going to win, and we're just going to see what he's going to do a little different this time. God keeps the game interesting mm -hmm. so that we will see more than just his bare power, so that we'll see his wisdom, his creativity, his subtlety, his sense of humor. Secondly, God deliberately lets the wicked prosper for a time so we can deliver their wealth, knowledge, and technology into our hands. Proverbs says the wealth of the sinners laid up for the just. Uh, Israel inherited a great many things that they didn't build, they didn't plant, they didn't construct. The wells of water, the vineyards, the homes. Um, God lets the wicked do lots of stuff so that in a generation or two, we can turn around, grab them, inherit them, and use them for the kingdom of God. Phones, computers, the internet, um, the microchip, the internet. You know, we, well, by and large, we didn't invent that stuff. We, we, we backed off and the world invented them and the world developed them and the world perfected them. And then suddenly we are here using computer technology built on microchip technology. And we're talking to, we hope, maybe hundreds of people in the name of Jesus, telling them things they might not hear otherwise. God has long range plans. And, and sometimes it, um, they're not obvious. And then lastly, and this is what I really wanted to touch on, there's a kind of spiritual growth that can only take place as God's people wrestle with temptation and indwelling sin. There's a maturity in faith that must grow without emotional support or encouragement. And I'm thinking here of um, Screwtape Letters, it's letter eight, where uh, Screwtape is talking to his nephew Wormwood and trying to convince him how the best way to go about tempting humans is. And um, he says, yeah, it's, it's great when the human feels completely deserted by God. That's great. Despair, you know, that may lead to a suicide or just a rejection of faith, but be careful because there's another possibility. Some of the greatest possibilities for growth come in those deep troughs, those deep valleys. And he says this, be not deceived, Wormwood. Our cause is never more in danger than when a human, no longer desiring, but still intending to do the enemy's will. That is, you're at the point of saying, I don't even care anymore. Why am I a Christian? I don't, I'm not sure I believe any of this stuff. I don't even want to serve God. But I guess I will do this thing because it's, what else am I going to do? All God says it. I guess I'm going to do it. But boy, this is interesting. And he does. He, no longer desired, but still intending to do our enemy's will, looks around upon a universe from which from which every trace of him seems to have vanished, and asks why he's been forsaken, and still obeys. That's faith. That's the faith we see in the psalmist on occasion where he cries out, why have you just, well, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And yet does not turn back, does not let go, does not give in, and keeps doing what God wants. That's the kind of faith in the growth that is most precious to God. Now, Jesus, of course, did not have to do dwell with indwelling sin. But we're told that though he were a son, he learned to obedience by the things that he suffered. Gethsemane, he came mm -hmm. to terms with what it means to face God when the obedience costs you everything, when it hurts like literally hell, and everyone deserts you. And yet you do it because it is the Father's will.
or because in your mind there is no choice. It's not fun. It's not joy. It's not peace. It is simply obedience to the God to whom you've committed your life. And so another reason why God does not flood us with spiritual revival every day, we would grow. He gives us Canaanites, thorns in the flesh, so that we may learn his grace is sufficient. His strength is made perfect in our weakness. Again, so the glory may be both. So maybe there's a revival around the corner. I got no problem with that. <laughs> I have no problem with the spirit sweeps through Washington and New York and L.A., and the little hinterlands of America, and everybody goes to church, and everyone hears the preaching of the gospel, and they go out and they tear down all of the various idols. I won't even list what comes to my mind. And uh, they all set out to raise their children in the fear or na an admonition of the Lord and to tell everybody, know the Lord. If that happens, I am there. I am relieved. I will praise God. But if not, and I have to get up tomorrow and go to school, again and get ready for a new school year and photocopy a million things <laughs> and set up grade books for the 40th time. Okay. We got this. Let's do this and by God's grace one more time and then trust him for what the outcome may be. Mm -hmm. Once more feeling optional. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Do we have any recommendations for this evening? Well, actually, since I, I happened to reach over and, and touch it where I left it the other day, I'm going to recommend um, singing psalms. Oh, a, uh, oh is for, that the new one from the OPC? And the, it's not. This is the um, old one from the RPCNA. Yeah, our church is just that. I have mm -hmm. a, an exclusive psalmist friend who I think listens to uh, this podcast. Sorry, James, I, I'm not EP, but... <laughs> um, <laughs> Highly recommend singing Are psalms. Are you an inclusive psalmist? I am, in fact. That's what I am. Um, I didn't know there... that was really a thing. I thought it was a joke. Oh, no. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah. that's, it's a real term. It's it's the pithy <laughs> response when everyone's like, oh, you're not EP. And I'm like, no, I'm IP. You know, everyone <laughs> jokes online. <laughs> uh, but like, anyway. It sounds like in... ways of measuring beer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, and I'll also uh, double up on this recommendation. There is a app for a split leaf psalter. And basically Ooh. it lets you digitally anyway, split leaf for those who don't know, is a psalter book that has a line uh, cut through the center of all the pages. So on the top are the notes, like the, the sheet music, and on the bottom are the metrical psalms. And you can flip around and decide which tune to sing with which oh, psalm. Oh, wow. So it's a split That's leaf. That's interesting. Um, there is a split leaf Psalter app. I think it's just called 1650 Psalter because that was the year the uh, Church of Scotland, I believe, put together the uh, the metrical the hymn the the Psalms of David in meter, and mm -hmm. uh, it lets you choose your Psalm text, your desired tune for it, although it will give you suggestions based on what has been printed in the past. And it even includes little tiny MIDI files of the tune itself if you're not familiar with it. So oh, I will that recommend that, right. um, which I love when I remember to do evening devotions. I like to sing something from the uh, the Split Leaf Psalter app, and I listen to it first with the MIDI so that I know I'm singing it. <laughs> I know how to sight read occasionally, but not every day. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know how to sight read at all, so that's great. Now, that's that's wonderful, Brian. And therefore, I'm going to, and this is going to make Emily go last, sorry, Emily. That's okay. But, uh, well, the spirit's on me. I'm going to follow that up with. <laughs> my recommendation is family devotions. Mm. We were talking about personal devotions. I'm going to recommend family devotions. This is one area where I can say God blessed us for many, many, many years. About 20, really. Uh, maybe a little longer. But it requires making things a priority. If you after school are, are taking your kids in all kinds of different directions to all kinds of different commitments, it's hard to get everybody home and at the dinner table at the same time. I guess the alternative would be the breakfast table. We always did the dinner table. But then that means getting everybody up a little bit earlier. And that means everybody and, and have them in a cheerful mind, set of mind. I think the evening's better for that. But I, I, the, the Bible doesn't specify. Find a time. Get your family there. Read the Bible. 
dad, or mom as the case may be if there's no dad around, explain the text, even if just a little. Ask a few questions, even just a little. Answer the kids' questions. And then pray together. Pray for people you know, for people they know. And, and watch for the watch for the answers. You need to keep a little prayer journal. Here's what we pray for. Oh, look, that one's been answered. Let's cross that off. Let's remember to give God thanks. And uh, we we would do this, and then we would end with the Lord's Prayer. So every day we pray the Lord's Prayer. And this together with our making dinner together and eating dinner together it took up a lot of time, but it really helped us solidify our family values in terms of the Word of God. Uh, this this was what we did. This is this was it, and it wasn't until the girls all started getting jobs and and other commitments that tore them in all sorts of ways that it suffered. But for, up until their first or second year of college, it was it was something by and large that we did consistently, with a few exceptions now and then. But it was a wonderful thing, wonderful time together. But it does require that making the word of God a priority for your family. Well, it requires that you have to make the word of God a priority for your family and not say, well, yeah, it's we 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 we're trying room for improvement. Uh we we've we we don't do so well. I'm I'm an elder, as many of you know. And and when we do elder visitation, one of the questions that one of the elders will always ask is, So how are how are your personal devotions? How are your family devotions? And it is very rare to get someone who says, Well, they are robust and on talking. I did appreciate one that we got not too long ago. It's like well, they're very, not very good. I mean, I do read the Bible every single day and usually do oh, some wow. kind of prayer afterward. And I, I'm glad for your Way humility. ahead of a lot of us. <laughs> yeah. Way ahead. And then as Brian says, uh, we we did this when the children were very little and they couldn't tell that I couldn't sing. Uh, <laughs> we would we would add songs in uh, and try to match the songs to whatever we were reading, which was fun to find a, a hymn or a psalm or even a, a praise chorus that would relate to the words we had actually read in the text. This, this is what we're talking about. Are we going to really make the kingdom of God a priority every single day in a way that's visible and that will change us little by little? And there's no guarantee that after the first week or two or three or 10, that your family's going to be on fire for the Lord. Don't know God's time schedule. But uh, as one character in a sci-fi show was asked, so you don't want to learn that language because it'll take you 10 years. And where will you be in 10 years if you don't learn it? <laughs> 10 years older and still not knowing the language. Okay, maybe I should start then. Yeah, maybe maybe your sanctification should begin now. Uh, and it doesn't have to be perfect, but begin. Yeah. <laughs> Steve Martin said about playing the banjo that he figured if he kept on playing the banjo at a certain point, he'd have been playing the banjo for a good long time. And then <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so he kept on playing the banjo, kept and uh, it, yeah. look where he is today. Steve Martin, <laughs> yeah. the foremost funny man with the banjo. <laughs> I, I also that also reminds me, like uh, I found, I saw something, I read something earlier this week about um, somebody said, "I've been studying for a year of this foreign language, and I can only speak it as well as an eight-year-old." Like, how long do you think it took the eight-year-old? <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Good point. Well, I'm going to stay on theme with my recommendation. Um, it's a little bit vague, but I'll include some examples. Um, yeah, I mean, that was that was very convicting in our house. Uh, family devotions, especially this summer, have really suffered. There's just, I could make all the excuses of there's a lot going on right now, but it's an excuse. But we ha have really appreciated um, in this time before we have children taking our, our after dinner family devotions for some more challenging works. We read Christ of the Covenants by O. Palmer Robertson. Mm -hmm. Our current work is Isaiah, the commentary by Matir. And I was kind of skeptical at first. I was like, am I really going to remember from day to day what we talked about? And like, are, are we going to be with it after a full day enough to sort of mm. really get this dense material and the Lord really blessed it. Um, you can understand so much more than you think you can. <laughs> I mean, we say that about kids all the time, but I think it's, it's true of ourselves as well. So I recommend, especially if you, 
are in a position where your kids are older or you don't have kids yet, pick something challenging to get you deeper in the word of God. Hmm. Yeah, that's my recommendation. Very good. All right. Thank you guys both so much for this conversation. It's been a delight. Thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Thank you to you, our listeners. We appreciate you tuning in. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can reach us at haltingtowardsion at gmail.com. Um, you can like our Facebook page. I think you can send us Facebook messages if you wanted to, but we don't check them very often. <laughs> so definitely, if you want to really get a hold of us, send us an email. Uh, tell a friend about us. If, if you're listening and finding us uh, or finding this discussion edifying, chances are you know somebody else who will too. So thank you to our financial supporters. If you'd like to join their number, you can visit our website, which is anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion. Thank you again so much for listening. We'll see you next week.